one of the things that I said a lot on the 50th anniversary of the ADA, which was back in uh, 2005, is that as a movement, we've had pretty much the same message and the same strategy for 30 years. And our outcomes are arguably abysmal. I mean, if you look at our employment outcomes, you look at our uh, high school graduation rates, you look at our college graduation rates, you look at our percentage of people who own their own homes, uh, we're not getting to where we want it to be. Um, and I think part of the reason we're not getting to where we want to be is we don't have enough male Romanos in our movement really forcing us to test our messages. One of the things that Neil says is we need to stop using the word accommodation. He thinks the word accommodation sends the wrong message to the business community. He thinks we should talk about accommodations in terms of productivity. Call it a productivity enhancement or a productivity enhancer as opposed to an accommodation. What can I do as a manager to increase your productivity? Um, and you know, I just thought that was pretty bold for him to get up in front of a disability audience and tell us to stop using the word that's enshrined in our civil rights law. But you know, he's a, he's a social marketing guy. He, he's thinking about how is this going to be heard by the average employee. So, and helping you all, because I think you all are, are the kind of choir at some level within your companies. You're the folks that are making the case for whatever needs to be done around disability and diversity. Um, so you, we need to arm you with the best ammunition possible so that you can make a stronger business case internally. And what I heard Neil doing is really saying, frame it as a productivity issue. Don't frame it necessarily in civil rights terms. It's fine to have that, that you know, hammer of the civil rights thought, but if you can frame it in terms of productivity, you might actually get farther and get the employer thinking differently. So um, again, I think if we, if we frame this differently and think of it in a universal design concept that we're trying to design workplace practices and policies that work well for all workers, uh, it may help deal with co-worker resentment, it may help deal with management resistance, and if it's framed in productivity terms and we can measure the productivity uh, enhancements that come from having these practices in place, I just think we're going to get where we're trying to go faster. I want to share one other uh, personal story um, that relates to the topic of non-apparent or hidden disabilities. You know, my disability, as I mentioned, is bipolar disorder. But the way that it affects me is I go about six months where I have a lot of energy, a lot of self-confidence, not a lot of patience. Um, I can be obnoxious, you know, during that period. And then uh, my energy goes down and my, my self-confidence goes down. And for me, it's very predictable. And in the fall and in the spring is typically when those transitions are happening for me. Um, so, you know, one of my challenges professionally was uh, kind of who do I tell that to? When do I tell them? How do I tell them? So um, I just wanted to share one story that I think helps explain one of the challenges around this topic of non-apparent disabilities. When I was finishing up, my first job was at the, the first job doing this kind of work was at the Disability Law Center in Boston. I was a fellow there for two years. I had graduated from Stanford Law School, clerked for a federal judge, you know, very kind of blue chip resume, and I was applying for jobs at the end of my fellowship. And one of the places that I applied to was a national advocacy group based in Washington, D.C. that advocated on behalf of people with psychiatric disabilities in particular. So I self-identified in my cover letter as a mental health consumer. That's the terminology that I used at the time. If I had done it today, I wouldn't have used that terminology. I would have just said a person with a psychiatric disability. But at that point, I was still kind of figuring out how to refer to myself professionally. So I said a mental health consumer. One of the people who was checking the references talked to Susan Butler Plum, who's the head of the SCAD Fellowship Program, which was the fellowship that I was on to, to work at the Disability Law Center. And he said, you know, Susan, uh, I assume you know Andy, he's a SCAD fellow. In his cover letter, he said he was a mental health consumer. Um, you know, what can you tell me about that? And Susan said, well, you know, Andy's fine as far as I can tell, but really you should have that conversation with him. Now, he did that in 1993, after the Americans with Disabilities Act took effect. Um, so he basically violated the Americans with Disabilities Act when he asked her that question. 
And when I was working at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, I had a chance to use that as an example in their enforcement guidance. We're obviously not referring to him, but we have an example in the enforcement guidance that makes it clear that that is a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I ended up coming to town to interview with other for other jobs, and I let them know I was going to be in town and said, would you like to interview me while I'm in town? And they said, sure. So I came in, I interviewed with the person who had asked the question of the reference and his colleague. These two people were considered at the time and to this day two of the most high-powered, effective advocates for people with psychiatric disabilities. We went through the whole interview, they never raised a question. At the end of the interview, I said, I know you talked to one of my references about me being a mental health consumer, and I want to take this opportunity to answer any questions you might have about that. Um, and, yeah, this is when I was in my high energy period, so I was kind of obnoxious, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, he, um, he looked like he had swallowed a frog, but he basically just didn't say anything. <laughs> um, and uh, his colleague, who didn't know, obviously, that this had occurred, also was a little nervous. And she said, well, Andy, you know, is there anything you want to tell us? Which probably was the only legal thing she could say at that point, because this is pre-employment. They had not made me a job offer. Um, so, you know, she said, is there anything you want to tell us? And I said, although actually, you know, because EEOC changed their guidance, because I put it on the table, they could have asked me if I needed an accommodation, but they didn't. They just said, um, is there anything you want to tell us? So I you know, went into a little bit about my condition and how it affects me and why I thought it might be relevant. I was working at an organization that is advocating for people with psychiatric disabilities to have somebody that has that personal experience uh, in the organization. And it was clear that she was uncomfortable with kind of me being in the in crowd and her being in the out crowd in my terminology. So she said, oh, come on, Andy, we all see a therapist. Why is that relevant? And that reaction is actually not uncommon at all in terms of this whole category of non-apparent disabilities. The, the first reaction is often, oh, come on, you know, I have my hip problem, or, you know, I have this, or I have that. We're all in this category. Why are you wearing it on your sleeve, you know? Why, why are you asking for something that I didn't ask for or when I needed that, you know? So I think that's a very common thing, that it's not significant enough to matter, and therefore it's not legitimate. I think you've run into that a lot in the whole spectrum of non-apparent disabilities. But it's also interesting what happened after that. So when she said that, that kind of got me even more kind of obnoxious. So I kind of, I went into some of my um, uglier parts of my disability because I wanted her to understand that no, this is not a hangnail, this is not neurosis, you know, this is a diagnosed psychiatric condition that plays a huge role in my life. And it's not something that easy, has been easy for me to navigate. Um, and at some point, it was like a, a switch went off in her head, and she was, oh yeah, this guy really is disabled. You know, this guy really does have something serious. And then she immediately went to the staff person that they had had, who was bipolar, who was inappropriate at staff meetings. And again, that's not uncommon. It's like you're either not significant enough to matter, or you're so significant that you're not desirable or qualified for the position. And keep in mind, again, I had the blue chip resume. I had a lot of experience as a young lawyer in Massachusetts working in coalitions. I had a lot to bring to the table, but she really fixated on that bipolar thing. And again, she was one of the top lawyers in the country advocating for people with psychiatric disabilities. So I tell that story just to say that a, and this has been true throughout my career, you never know who's going to get it, and you never know who's not going to get it. You know, and on that same trip, you know, I, I interviewed with Bobby Silverstein, the high-powered chief counsel for Senator Tom Harkin on the Senate Subcommittee on Disability Policy. I told him I had bipolar disorder, and it was like no big deal for him. You know, he he was looking at my resume.